Okay, let's take another question, Rachel. What's a unique insight about food and or robotics you learned from your investment in Cafe X? Oh, wow. Learned a lot. Okay. Let's talk about hardware. When you're building a hardware company, whether it's Density, which does people counting, or Cafe X, or we had a smoke detector company, um, and uh, we had a, a webcam company, like a, a drop cam competitor. In all four of those cases, I learned that hardware is hard. Because when you make a hardware company, you have to buy 10,000 units, you have to fabricate them, you have to ship them, all of that. And you have to get people to pay for the hardware. And then you still have to build all the software. So a software company builds software. And a hardware company builds software and hardware. Plus, they have to distribute them. Now you look at Cafe X. They have to build the hardware. They got to build the software. They also have to manage locations and they have to manage the maintenance of those machines. In other words, the consumer facing stuff. So when they did their locations, it was great. It was working. Fantastic. But you basically are running three startups, a retail operation, a hardware operation, and a software operation. That's hard. So you're basically running Sweet Greens, you're running Fitbit or Apple Watches, and you're running a software company like Slack. Sounds hard, right? It is. And then uh, eventually where Caf Cafe X wound up was, you know, the airport locations were fantastic. One hour of maintenance, and they had to get through a lot of local regulations like one county might be fine with milk being in a vending machine. Another county might say no milk in vending machines because there were, you know, health concerns about it. Well, in the in a modern robotic one, you don't have to worry about milk, uh, fresh milk being in it. It's refrigerated. We have sensors. But in an old coffee machine, you could only do powdered, right? So there were some antiquated regulations. You add that to it. Turns out they brushed it inside of SFO. I won't say the numbers. It's up to Henry to share them. but that is a really good business. But operating is hard. So they've moved to, hey, if you want to buy the machine for, I think, 250k, and then pay a maintenance fee or a service fee of 2000 a month, you can buy the machines and put them anywhere you want. And now they've had a half dozen people do that. So they took out, we're going to be the retail operator, you go, put them in, we'll sell them to you hardware as a service has, you know, SAS, this is has. Hardware as a service. Density did the same thing. Density makes sensors that will tell you how many people are in a restaurant or a cafe. What they realized was um, the hardware business stinks and those customers, let's say cafes, do they really get a ton of value from this? Not as much value as an enterprise company. So imagine you're some giant company with a campus like NYU or Stanford. Uh, or your Microsoft or Google or Facebook or LinkedIn, somebody who's got a giant campus. Now you've got a million square feet, hundreds of thousands of square feet. You don't know how your space is being used. You know how people in planning figure that out? They send somebody out there with a clipper and they count people or they set up a webcam and they count everybody on the webcam. Now imagine if I could show you in real time and you play a button and you see the floor plan of the 50th floor, the 49th floor and the 48th floor of your most expensive office space in Manhattan looking out of Central Park. And you can see the capacity of all the spaces and how utilized the spaces are. And now you find out your boardroom is being used by one person on average or 1.2 people. And you're like, well, that's a 12 person boardroom that's costing us $400,000 a year. And it's being used as a phone booth. So then you get three phone booths and you find out that they're used 80% of the time. And those are costing you $15,000 a year each. Oh my God, what a better use of space. And then, you know, the legal department is saying we need this much space and the sales department is saying we need this much space. But the IT department is like actually using their space and the lawyers and the salespeople are never there. So now you can have the operations people because of density uh, are able to say, you know what? And it's density.io. Uh, we have hardware that we pay for that is not cameras. So it doesn't invade anybody's privacy. And we know exactly the utilization of the entire space. So we're going to consolidate the New York operation from three floors down to two. We're going to put six more phone booths in because those are what we need. And we're going to take that 12 person boardroom that never gets used. And we're going to put two dividers in it. And we're going to make it into three, four person breakout rooms. And then if people need to, we'll take the dividers out for the three times a year we have a board meeting in that boardroom. Brilliant stuff like that. Uh, and if you pay for it as a service, just a monthly fee, and you abstract the hardware cost into that, it makes it much more accessible. And you're now 
you found your ideal customer profile. So that's what hardware companies really have to do. They have to figure out a way to turn it into a subscription. And it's really interesting as a business. You have to get out of certain businesses and find your ideal customer profile. So if opening up a bunch of locations in San Francisco and they get vandalized, it's a terrible idea. But, you know, having airports uh, or campuses is a, a great idea. Awesome. So, you know, to the founders of Cafe X, Henry and Andrew at Density and their teams, my Lord, you have my respect because hardware is hard. But if you do figure it out, hardware plus software in a, in a subscription package, it's super powerful. I think it's super powerful. And I think actually uh, Density's had massive success. Obviously, Henry and, and Cafe X took a bad beat because of the pandemic. But coming out of the pandemic, there's no workers and nobody wants to be a barista and people want 24 hour service. And maybe people don't want people touching their food as much or as much contact with other humans. Contactless is now something that consumers want. And let's face it, people don't want to work in those jobs. So the idea when Cafe X came out was like, oh my God, you're taking away barista jobs. And now it's like, nobody wants those jobs. We all admit nobody wants those jobs. Nobody wants to be a driver anymore. So self-driving. Uh, nobody wants to work in a field, you know, picking strawberries. So rude AI is picking strawberries with robots. I think we're going to see the robots uh, and hardware play a bigger role and the robots are leaving the factories. And that really is the trend in the bet we made on Cafe X was robots have changed how factories work. Now what happens when the robots leave the factory? That was my basic premise. And I looked at everything, the dishwashing bot, the French fry one, they're all out there. And I think post pandemic with this uh, crisis of we're not letting immigrants into the country who would take these jobs. So we're anti immigrant. And we got 10 million jobs, and Americans don't want to take those jobs. And those jobs, you know, if they cost $35 an hour, or $25 an hour for a dishwasher, which is what they were getting paid in San Francisco. I know that sounds crazy. People always email me. And when I tell them what people get paid in San Francisco, I'm like, that's crazy. I'm like, now try buying a house <laughs> in San Francisco, you really get the definition of crazy. Yeah, people somebody I know is paying $35 an hour for a dishwasher in San Francisco. If you're paying $35 an hour, and it's a 10 hour shift, and it's 350. And you've got, you know, two shifts a day, $700 a day. And you're open 300 days a year, you know, you start to figure out you're spending hundreds of 1000s of a year on the dishwasher function at your restaurant. Yeah, you might switch to a robot. You might, right, you might start thinking, you know, what? okay, now it's time to do a robot. When you can get people to work for 10 bucks an hour as a dishwasher or to make french fries, you don't think about it. You're like, I can get people people need the jobs. I'll just hire people for 10 bucks an hour. And so that's a little bit more than yes for but I think it's going to be a very interesting when the robots leave the factories. And it's gonna be great for society because humans always find other work. And so the idea that humans are not going to create more jobs is silly, like we're going to always create more jobs. There are there's the creator economy, people are getting paid to make podcasts that are super niche, they're getting paid to tweet, they're getting paid to write email newsletters on any number of subjects, Patreon, you just look at the world of creativity on YouTube and people making a living there. Twitch people are getting like we're talking about tens of thousands of people on Twitch are getting paid to play video games. If I told you to, you know, if you told me in the 80s, imagine getting paid to play video games, I would have been like a video game tester. Like I actually thought about that as a career. The two jobs I really wanted when I was in my teens, uh, I wanted to be Roger Ebert, I wanted to get paid to watch movies and then write about them because I just something clicked to me and said, Wait a second, I love going to the movies. And that guy's getting paid. It was like one of my earliest observations in entrepreneurship was that Siskel and Ebert were getting paid to watch movies. And I love going to movies and I was paying to watch them. It was like, when that lit up in my brain, I was like, whoa. And then somebody told me about video game testing. And I was like, wait a second. You go to work and play video games. I'm going to work and then going home to play video games. Hmm, I'd like to have that job. <laughs>